Mr. Bowden, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you for inviting and including me in this uh, little webinar. It's a nice refresh on everything, kind of out of practice, seeing as we've been off the road here for about five months. Uh, fortunately, uh, not able to mix it up with all of our people out on the road and our various oh. uh, festivals and cities. So, yeah, this will be a little, uh, a little uh, refresher course. Crazy world, uh, this, this 2020 um, that we're in. Um, and a lot of strange things have been happening. Naturally, not only are um, all of the festivals for this year and already starting into 2021 canceled and presumably gone on the, on the nature side of business, at least. Um, but the unattended effect of people being locked down is a lot, a lot of people, you know, um, looking out at stuff in their backyards and realizing they're surrounded by nature and wildlife. And there's a lot of um, growth um, in new bird watchers, nature watchers, people interested in looking at things. Um, and that's part of the reason that I wanted to do, uh, again, sort of a review of our binocular lines because there's a lot of people buying binoculars right now for the first time, um, as well as people that are gonna be looking to upgrade uh, on the birding side very soon. Um, in preparation for fall migration, um, people going out hunting, um, you know, there's, it's a, it's a time kind of a, a period just before when everyone's ramping up for new equipment. So that'd be an opportune time to talk about these and, and, um, hopefully between both of us, we'll remember everything about all the binoculars that we have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No tests at the end, please. <laughs> With luck. Um, so, you know, co-op, uh, as a company has been known um, for our spotting scopes primarily and not withstanding the last quality spotting scope I bought back in 1991 was a COA TSN series, which I still have and love fondly right there. I uh, used that without fail for 15 years in all kinds of very uh, um, harsh environments, including um, on the Bering Sea. Uh, in the Aleutian Islands, guiding professionally out there um, in the wilds of Alaska, and it held up remarkably well. It's still still ticking. Um, that, of course, has been replaced by our state of the art now is the Koa 883, 88 millimeter objective lens. And most people are aware of our spotting scopes, and um, there are rave reviews in the marketplace. Um, as surely as the old TSN 1234 back in 1990 ish kind of took over the world as you know uh, the best performing scopes were still there today and independent reviews despite lots of competition um, the National Audubon Society's um, scope buying guide that you can look up online rated the 883 their number one choice the best performing spotting scope in the marketplace which is great because it's actually lighter weight shorter than a lot of the other um, premium models and comes in from, is anywhere from 850 to as much as $1,400 below um, the other alphas, which it outperformed and outscored by a, a fair margin. Um, so yeah, spotting scopes are what we're known for. We're gonna talk about the binoculars today because the same quality that goes in our spotting scopes, which is known, goes into the binoculars. Um, for our friends in Europe, it seems like they have better distribution and better sales of our binoculars maybe in Europe than in the U.S. here. But, you know, everyone that buys them sees them, falls in love with them. So I wanted to tell you all about that so you're familiar with our lines because um, it does seem like uh, we definitely have a lot more familiarity with our spotting scope lines right now. Um, so to begin with binoculars, uh, I want to talk about where our lines start. We started at about $100 price point with these. The YF binoculars is a great binocular. It um, is probably the best binocular you can get still at $100 price point. It's a poro prism design, which means the objective lens cell here and the eyepiece here are not in a straight line with one another, but offset, right? Comes up and does that little offset right there. Um, they're compact. Uh, they come in a six by 30 and an eight by 30. Um, they're small enough that small hands can use them and they get very close in what we call the interpupillary distance so that uh, small eyes can effectively use these as well. So they're good for children, but anyone that's getting into nature for the first time 
looking for a, a, a good starter binocular, or even a backup binocular to uh, keep by your window by a bird feeder, put under uh, the seat of the car. These YFs at 100 bucks is a, a wonderful investment and well worth the, the price um, that you get there. Anything you want to add on the YFs, Paul? Yeah, I, I mean, the good thing with those two, as far as um, being at 100 bucks, is that, uh, you know, they're also waterproof. Um, you'd mentioned the IPD, um, but just for people uh, to be aware, uh, it's a 50 millimeter minimum. So it's about uh, six to seven millimeters smaller than any of our other uh, series of binoculars, with the exception of compacts, of course. Mm -hmm. Talking about like a 33 or 44, 32s, 42s. Um, and then also, uh, there's two magnification options with those. There's a 6x30 and there's an 8x30. And uh, we've actually transitioned in the 6 magnification to the new YF2 series. Uh, same optics, same everything. If you're looking at it, the only difference is, is that the body is uh, green. So um, Made it to match our other lines color-wise as well. So if you end up ordering a six by 30 uh, and you get a green one, don't panic. It's just the new version. And uh, as soon as we sell through our eight by thirties, uh, those will be transitioned as well over to those uh, green bodies. Right. So obviously to reach a price point of a hundred dollars, you know, knowing that we've got binoculars that range over from a hundred dollars all the way up to 1500. And when we get into our Highlanders, even beyond, um, but in a standard binocular you wear around your neck, um, obviously, everything's compromised. And, and the reason that binocular manufacturers have so many different types and styles that we'll look at uh, of binoculars are to reach not only different price points, but to match different um, performance criteria to do. So obviously at $100, the glass is not going to be the same level as our premium. Um, you know, uh, there's gonna be a lesser performance product. Um, the Poro Prism design is a little cheaper to make, so that's one of the reasons that it's uh, less expensive. It has an external bridge for a focusing system that goes up and down here, sliding up and down rather than an internal focusing system. So there's compromises you have to make to reach price points, obviously. Uh, it's got the simple diopter adjustment on the barrel right here. Um, just twist back and forth to adjust for uh, one eye or the other to, so that both eyes are in focus at the same time. But that's our Sort of beginning binocular. Uh, these are super popular. We sell a ton of these to various Audubon's groups, um, youth birding groups, uh, classrooms, um, nature centers, things of that nature because the price point is so good but also the performance is excellent on, on the little YF binoculars. So moving up the line we have also our next series would be our SV binocular, the SV2 by Koa. Okay, we've got 32 millimeter, 42 millimeter, 50 millimeter models here, uh, as well as true compacts. So let's start talking about the compacts first. Now, like I was talking about before, um, in, a, in a compact model, everything's about compromise. The advantage of a compact binocular is the ability to fold it up like this and be able to stick it in a pocket. So you can have it with you anywhere you go. But to do that, you've got to have a really small, barrels, generally speaking. Um, so uh, to get these, the newer binoculars, these wider field of views, you have to bend light at extreme angles. So it's hard to get a really wide field of view through a, a small tube in a, in a compact. So most compacts are gonna suffer um, from that way. Uh, the other thing too about sometimes when something's so little in light, if you have bigger hands, for me, it's hard to hold a true compact steady because I can't really grip it well. Um, so that's one of the things about a compact binocular, they're great as a backup pair, but if you're buying a new pair and you want it to be a primary um, binocular, a lot of people will find that when they use a compact as their primary glass, due to the smaller field of view that they get, you have difficulty finding your subject, you know, you have to be very precise. Um, and then of course you have a smaller circle of light entering your eye, so again, you're not going to have the optical performance of a larger binocular. Uh, that said, the uh, the SV compacts come um, in the U.S. again, where at a, a $100 price point, they come in an 8 power and a 10 power with a 25 millimeter objective lens, okay, there. So when you have a smaller objective lens, that means you're going to collect less light. You're delivering less light out the backside to your eye. That's sort of a general rule of thumb on all of these things. 
but that's the compacts um, on the model. Talking about our full size binoculars, which what I'd recommend for someone if you're starting with, um, uh, you know, glassing, I'd start with a full size. Um, Paul, you have anything you want to add on the, the compacts in particular, or g generically, or the SV in particular? No, I mean, for the most part, uh, with either SV or the BD um, compacts, you, you know, there's, there's, uh, time and place, I guess, for them, you know, a secondary pair that you might keep in your uh, glove compartment, something, uh, you know, it seems like kayakers, uh, you know, different uh, sporting events, different applications would be more uh, prudent for those. Uh, but I see when um, some of the, uh, I guess, uh, the things they lack, um, we tend to see more people opting for a 32 millimeter because they're still compact um, per se, compared, not as much so compared to uh, the actual 25s, but they give you a performance uh, similar to a full size optic. So we start to see more people using those uh, sizes as a secondary piece of equipment. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and I agree with that too. The 32s, especially when we get to our BDs, you'll see just how small they've gotten. And I think that has kind of uh, put a damper on, on compact sales to a degree because now you've got a binocular that has much better functionality that approaches the size and weight of the true compacts. And it does seem like maybe we've seen some falling off in the compact class as a result, you know, as 32s become more popular. So we already talked about the YF being a poro prism design. Um, moving up the chain again would be our, our SV models. This is a roof prism design. And as you can see, the objective lens here and the ocular or the eyepiece are in straight line with one another on a roof prism design. Tends to be make them a little bit smaller, perhaps a little more ergonomically friendly um, to handle. Uh, this is a six by 30 or excuse me, eight by 30 and the eight by 32. So a fairly comparable size and performance. So it'll have the same magnification um, as the YF. Couple advantages to a roof prism um, is, one, I already mentioned the, the ergonomics difference. But also um, something about these is they've got an internal focusing system, which we're gonna add a little bit to the price. That's a little more expensive to make a roof prism because it requires more, um, yeah, more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, sophistication, you have to be more precise on the placement and the bending of light because it's bending five times inside of a roof prism. So they average a little bit more expensive and not coincidentally, let's see the SVs here in the US, the full size started about 239 and go up to 299 in the large 50 millimeter models here. So um, this is our next lineup for someone that wants uh, something with internal focusing and a roof prism does make it probably a little more rugged um, on average than the, than, um, the average Poro prism design because of the way that the, the prism is, is far offset like that probably makes them a little more prone to being knocked out of alignment as does this external focusing bridge here, right? Um, but again, everything's a sacrifice. This is $100 for a reason. Um, so these average, you know, $250, let's say, um, the 32 millimeter up to the 50 millimeter, um, this is our 42 in between, excuse me, oops, I got it backwards. This is the 50, 42. Yeah, and the, the thing is too with the uh, SV starting at that um, series for us, that's our essentially our entry level uh, roof prism binocular. And as you move up to the BDs and then we move up to the Genesis, um, the design is the same, but those are when you're gonna start noticing the difference as far as the glass quality, um, the materials used to, uh, for the body itself, um, the focus wheels, the diopter wheels, all those type of differences um, add cost. So it's, uh, although it's same design as we move up, you're gonna start seeing uh, more mechanical and uh, quality of uh, material differences. And performance as well, which we'll get into a little bit with the BDs, it's, um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is our, so our, let's talk about that now actually, and let me start on the BD line so our BD2s are, we'll start with the BD compacts. Um, one advantage to a BD compact over the SV and a lot of the compacts is you have this double hinge design. It does allow the SV to, to fold up smaller and closer. Um, our BD compact has 
a single hinge design. So it doesn't uh, fold up quite as, as much, but it does make it much easier to get those small circles of light uh, centered on your eye than a double hinge design, which, you know, you've got more adjustment, so it can be a little trickier um, to get them perfectly lined up. So that's an advantage of our BD line. Uh, the BD compacts run twice the price of the SV. It's better glass as well um, at $200 starting point here in the US. All right, put that back. That's our eight by 25. Um, and we'll go into what Paul was talking about before with the midsize. So this is our BD2 line, the BD2 XD characterized. They were the first true wide angle um, binocular and still the best performing uh, wide angle binocular in the line as far as this model in particular, the six by six and a half by 32 in this line that see it's got a strap on it because I've been using it for my butterflying recently. Um, really great binocular. It's got a 10 degree wide field of view, which is wider than any other binocular out there. 18.2 um, ounces, it close focuses to just over four feet. So you can almost focus on your knee. Um, if you're taller, at least like me, certainly on your feet. Um, so it's great for that close focus work that's important to the birder and the general naturalist that's going to be looking at dragonflies, butterflies, beetles, things that uh, can be a little bit closer. Um, and to Paul's point earlier about the 32s, this is the BD compact, right? The 25 millimeter. This is the 32 millimeter. So you can see, especially on the BD2 line, they're so small and compact. See, it's the same height, barely wider um, on the 25. And that's, that's going to obviously impact the sales of the compact when you can get a binocular that's still basically pocketable in a, in a big pocket at least. Uh, maybe not a shirt pocket, but uh, it's 18.2 ounces, like I said. Um, and with the 32 millimeter glass, it has a very wide field of view uh, comparatively. The widest uh, field of view in the industry on the six and a half and the eights is right there as, as wide as any. Um, if we compare again to our BD line, look at the difference in the 32 millimeter models between the SV, excuse me here, SV2 and the BD2 over here. Uh, you can see how much smaller and more compact. We re reworked these and not surprisingly, this is our best selling line here in the US at least, and I think in Europe as well. Uh, I think that's true um, in the binoculars. And these are gonna, you know, you take a jump in price point though, you're going from $239 to 399 on the 32 millimeter, but the uh, ergonomics, the size and weight, and the mechanical performance, the performance specs of this are so much better as well as the glass that it's well worth every penny. Um, and it's been our best seller because in January and February, when we still had these shows and we were able to be in front of people, uh, folks would walk into the show, walk around to every table and, and invariably come back and buy these, it seemed like, once they compared them to everything else. We only brought these out in fall of what, 2019? What month did we roll them yeah, out? October. October so, launched, yeah. Yeah, so um, a lot of people still hadn't seen these and we're seeing them for the first time as we were hitting the show. So it's one I highly recommend considering looking at due to the performance. Um, again, 32, the 42 millimeter line, the 32, we have a six and a half, an eight power and a 10 power. And then in the 42s, uh, we have eight power and a 10 power respectively here. But again, compared to the SVs, which are less expensive, you know, there's a massive difference in size and weight um, and performance. So we're at 449 on the 42 millimeter model uh, BD2 XD binoculars here in the, in the US again. Uh, what's the close focus on the 42 millimeter models? I got to look that up. I know it's short. The 42s are just under six feet. Yeah, okay. So again, really good close focus. Generally speaking, 32 millimeters will always have a better close focus. And that's, you know, how, how close can you literally see something without it being blurry um, is, is your close focus mark. Um, anything you want to add to the BD conversation, Paul? 
Um, no, I mean, if there's people out there that's got experience with the BDs, that's kind of uh, grown with the line because it's been around for a long time. Um, obviously, this newest uh, iteration of them is beautiful. Uh, the engineers did a heck of a job with the design of this. Um, it really uh, just performs really well. Uh, you know, a lot of people love the BD series because of its size. It's a more of a compact uh, stout binocular, I guess you'd say, for even the 42s, you know, compared to, um, for instance, like you were saying, the full size, here's a, you know, here's the Genesis full size. It almost looks like it's a little brother kind of. And uh, uh, yeah, they're just a great, uh, great piece of uh, glass. And, you know, if uh, you're looking for kind of the thing with the binoculars like with the spotting scopes too is we try to give the most value you can at the price point so um, you know not only are you getting something that's mechanically and optically sound you're also getting it at a good value yeah and, and you know I've always been a sucker for wild field of view um, as, as a hawk watcher uh, sea watching pelagics you know I just love having a massive sweeping wide field of view it, it's always invariably going to add more eye comfort anyways but um, when you get that massive field of view, it also helps you locate your subjects very effectively um, when you're when you're in the field. So, um, compact size and weight compared to others. Uh, the 42 millimeter models come in at 22. I just looked it up. It was 22 and a half ounces, basically. Um, to put that in perspective, um, a lot of the Alpha glass run 28, 29 um, for the the high end. So it's significantly lighter weight. Um, and smaller, as Paul uh, showed, uh, comparing to our Genesis line, which is our, our highest performing line. And again, as we make these increases, it's not just random um, uh, bumps. Uh, you know, you're getting a better quality glass each time. The thing you need to consider is um, there's three lens elements here in the objective lens cell. There's going to be an internal focusing lens. There's going to be two glass prism blocks in here, and then as many as five or six um, lens elements here in the eyepiece at the top. So you're looking at potentially, you know, three, four, five, six, and another six, 12. Um, and in cases of binoculars that have a field flattener in there, um, as some do now, it could be a 13th piece of glass in each barrel. Um, so the quality of the glass and the cost of the raw blanks that you're starting with um, have a lot to do with the, the end result. You know, I'm sitting here staring at my, the reflection in my glasses here. Um, and to put that in perspective, this is just a single lens inside a plastic frame that's got some, you know, style component to it perhaps. But, you know, most people think nothing of paying $300, $400 for a pair of glasses that they can see well through consistently. Um, and so along those same lines, think about that. Something with 13 pieces of glass that you're looking through all day. Um, at 449 in this case, or 399 in the case of 32 millimeters, um, you basically are making sacrifices on the raw material qualities when you go down um, in price and all these things. We also carry, and I don't have one to show. Do you have a 56 by any chance there? I don't. You, I yeah. don't. We do carry um, the BD, not in the BD2 line, but the original BD line. We still have the 56 millimeter models um, in the lineup, uh, and those are 10X, 12X, um, respectively, at 599. Yeah, and there's um, an 8X in there, too. There's an 8X, okay. Yeah, 10, 10 and 12. Um, at 599, and, and, you know, people that are doing astronomy, um, for marine market, this right, the 856 is a real popular one for, for boating because, again, you're going to have a massive circle of light coming out of it. You're starting with 56 millimeters, um, so it's going to have the largest um, circle of light or what we call the exit pupil coming into your eye um, of any of our binoculars on that. So uh, real popular for, again, astronomy, uh, marine applications, and then the, the long, big power of the 12X, is um, that's our the most magnification we have in our line of our typical binoculars, but we'll get, we'll learn more about that in a little bit. So I think, unless there's more, you know, I think that about wraps up the BDs and the BD2 line. The next thing we want to talk about is our premier Genesis line. And we have, as before, 
our Genesis Compact. This is one of the best performing compacts. And if you've never looked at it, I welcome you to compare this to any compact in the marketplace. Uh, the Genesis Compact glass is stunning. And the view that you get in these 22 millimeter barrels um, is mind bogglingly good. You know, people that look through them and go, they can't believe the image that they're seeing through these, these glasses. If you've never looked through a Genesis Compact, do yourself a favor and do so. Um, the 822 uh, and we've got a 1022, um, our 799 and 849 respectively, but they're as good as any compact glass on the marketplace in my opinion. And I love to see an independent review on those to see what other people think. Um, this one has a slightly different control being a, a higher end glass. It's got the, um, diopter adjustments down here it's built into integrated into the focus system rather than being a twist ring on the barrel um, which does add to uh, some of the, the cost of making this mechanically all right they're a little bit heavier because as you get into better glass too the your weight is going to go up um, because it's a more molecularly dense glass it's going to have more mineral components in it uh, which generally is going to add to the weight of a binocular as you get into a better quality glass overall. But that's our, um, this is the eight by 22 Genesis Compact. And again, if you're in the market for a really incredibly well-performing um, compact glass, that's gonna do it right there. As before, we have uh, not a 32, but a 33 millimeter model um, as we move up the chain. Um, and we have our 44 millimeter models as what we call our full-size Genesis binoculars, okay? And again, this is our best performing models, um, has the best resolution, the best light delivery, and the clearest images overall, um, but at a price point. You know, the normal retail price point on these is $9.99 and $10.99 respectively for our um, 8x33 and our 10x33. In the 44 millimeter models, we add a half a power to the typical range. So we've got uh, an eight and a half by 44 and a 10 and a half by 44 millimeter uh, models. Again, normally priced at uh, here in the US um, at uh, 1399, $1499 respectively. Um, I'm lying, sorry, 1299, $1399 respectively. Uh, didn't mean to lie to you. So there, I just saved a hundred bucks. Beyond that though, is this a good time to talk about um, Time for the uh, shameless Genesis plug with the promotion. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't be doing our jobs, right? Yeah. So anyways, uh, the Genesis, uh, the 33 millimeter and 44 millimeter models are both on sale as we speak. Uh, as Jeff had mentioned, the uh, normal cost for the 33s is $9.99 or $10.99. Uh, those are on sale now for a limited time at $7.99. And then the 44s, uh, normally $12.99, $13.99. Uh, both sizes can be had for $9.99. As we mentioned, this is a very limited time, just uh, some little summer overstock sale. And uh, yeah, if you ever had a, a chance to, or um, an idea to try out the uh, Genesis, now would be the perfect time to do so. There it yeah. is. Well, there's the commercial. <laughs> yeah, and, and as Paul pointed out, you know, this is a perfect time. If you're looking, um, considering upgrading your binoculars, <clears throat> you know, you've been, you, you've got an older binocular you've been using for a while that's kind of beat up. Um, or, um, you know, for me, when I first started bird watching, I started with a hand me down 30 year old pair of Poro prisms that belonged to my grandfather. Uh, and I went and bought a $50 pair that I knocked out of alignment almost the first week, you know, at a dime store, worked my way up. I think my next pair was like a $250 pair. Uh, and finally up over the thousand dollar threshold um, going that's back in the nineties. So I'd made all these incremental jumps as I got more serious about it. Um, so I think that is sort of a common uh, scenario that people start lower than, you know, if you're starting say, this is kind of cool. And you start with something like the YF and, and, and work your way up. Um, and as you get more serious about it and you realize you like it more, you know, you'll, you'll invest more. So, if you're in that marketplace, the Genesis line, which is COA's best performing um, line, I'd hardly welcome anyone to take a look at that as, as maybe the binocular 
the last binocular they want to buy. And at the current pricing, this is kind of a really, really good deal. Um, as we said, it's as much as $400 off on the 10 and a half by 44. And then the 33 models, um, as much as $300 below the typical retail uh, for a short period of time. Um, as we know, most people are locked down or, you know, travel is limited, uh, may not have a dealer nearby. The good news is that um, so many dealers, especially in the, the, the age of COVID, um, have uh, worry-free return policies. So that's something you can look at. You know, you could always uh, pick one on, up to uh, freeze the price, see if you like it, and then send it back. Usually within 30 days, you have to look at the individual policies, but some people have up to 30 days um, return policy. So that's one of the things you can do happily in the current day and age that we're in right now with COVID restrictions. Um, as you'd expect on a premium glass, we've got easily twist up eyepieces with individual detents, which are real solid. You can hear them snap in at each point. It's real smooth. Um, real real smooth focus wheel but also it has enough resistance that it's not um, you're not going to race past your focus point um, great detail uh, as an example you know for me as a bird watcher seeing birds flying overhead in the morning um, i'm able to see all the shadow and, and there's enough light delivery through this quality glass and coatings that I'm seeing the detail on the underside and on the shadowed underwings of these birds flying overhead. And that's, you know, something that a better quality glass is going to do for you. Um, the lesser quality glass are all going to have the same power of magnification. So the size of the image you're seeing uh, will be the same, but generally speaking, as you move up in quality, what you're able to see, the amount of detail you're able to see, particularly in more challenging lighting conditions um, becomes, better and easier to see. A uh, classic example um, in the world of birding again, as I spoke about, not only is it very low light conditions because the superior glass and better coatings, which increase the price uh, of the products as you move up, um, deliver more light through the entire system to your eye. But the other thing that uh, it does is it helps to filter out non-image forming light. Um, so that glaring light that your eye can't process is easily um, is will give you less effect. You know, you can look at um, something that's harshly backlit and with a better quality binocular, you're going to fill those shadows and be able to see detail. And uh, I don't know if birders probably are more of a, um, of a social lot. You're going out in groups, you know, so you're more apt to see this, but you may be next to someone um, who's giving details on a bird that's silhouetted against the sky. And if you've got a lower quality glass, you just aren't seeing any of this detail they're talking about. Um, and that's one of the reasons that you upgrade as well. Um, those are the two main reasons when you get into the low light and even very harsh light, you know, bright light can be um, just as bad if it's pointed at you really and behind you. Um, i trying to think what else we can talk about, Paul. Well, as far as the Genesis too, I wanted to mention that, it, you know, it does have a locking uh, diopter on it as well. That's the only series that that has that. Um, so that's got, that, you know, a nice little touch that's added in more of the premium binoculars. Oh, there it is. So as you can see, I can't twist this easily unless I pop up the ring first and then twist it back and forth. When I get it where I need to, I snap it back shut and it's going to be locked in place so that I'm not going to accidentally bump that and uh, have to reset it for my eyes as I'm out in the field. Twist up eye cups, um, which really are on every binocular. Without binoculars, I'm going to twist those up so I get that up against my eye, but you can find different points because there's different set eye, you know, wells are, are different uh, depths and each person's going to have a different point when that's exactly right. But generally speaking with the glasses on, I'm going to have these rolled down because there is a set perfect spot distance between the lens and this eyepiece and the lens in my eye that's going to be most effective. The other thing we've talked about a couple times is the diopter and I suppose we can go over that one more time. I talk about this a lot but a lot of people really don't know how to set the diopter. So quickly um, one of the things you need to do 
the diopter is always slaved to the right barrel on a binocular. And the ones that have a ring on it make it a little easier to remember that. This is the control for the diopter, which is separate from the focus ring. So I need to focus the system to my left eye using the barrel. So I'll cover the right eye. I'll see a subject that has some detail on it that I can focus in on. And the best way I do that is go past focus a little bit, come back and stop. Um, that way it's, it's like, okay, it looks like it's in focus. I can go a little bit more to make sure. Nope, it's getting worse. Come back and stop. The more you fiddle with it going back and forth, your brain will start to assimilate focus and it, you can kind of confuse your eye a little bit if that makes sense. Um, so simple is better in that case. Once you have your left eye focused with the focus wheel, I have to adjust the right eye separately to get the same level of focus. So we're not gonna to touch the focus wheel anymore. We're gonna leave it with the left eye in focus. I'm gonna to move to the diopter, cover the left barrel, and you can actually use the, uh, the caps that come from the manufacturer if you want for that. And twist this back and forth in the same way, looking at the same subject in the same distance until the right eye is perfectly focused on the same subject. And that way, both eyes are in focus at the same time. You're gonna have the best view possible through your binocular with your eyes. So uh, what else you got? Um, just jumping back to the Genesis real quick, I did want to mention too, when you're trying to do like an apples to apples comparison against, uh, uh, you know, other binoculars that you're, that you may be considering that, uh, keep in mind that the Genesis is a 44 millimeter, uh, objective lenses as opposed to a 42. So it's about 5% bigger, uh, lens elements throughout the system. Uh, so it's going to add a little more weight. Um, but then also as well, the Genesis is at 8.5 magnification and a 10.5 magnification. Um, not going to create much of a, any difference, but just uh, some clarification in case you're uh, searching around online and you see those, uh, you know, those different specs. Yeah, they'll change some of the written specifications that are based on mathematical formulas. Um, you know, your exit pupil, your relative brightness index, uh, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, an important, important clarification. You get a little more power of magnification in these um, and more light reaching your eye, uh, starting with more light, that is, um, on the Genesis. And it's the same here, the 33 millimeter um, rather than a 32 on the, on the smaller 33 millimeters. And again, at a song. So if you've been considering upgrading, this is a really uh, good time at 999, 799 US um, to, uh, to be able to, pick those up. So I guess that leads us to the next line, such as <laughs> um, and it's, it's kind of, we call it a binocular, but like I say, we're known for our scopes. Uh, in some ways you could consider this, uh, by definition, it may be a binocular, but in, in a lot of ways it's more of a scope in that it's massive magnification with twin eyepieces that are um, adjustable. This is our Highlander binocular. Um, the kit comes equipped with two 32 power um, magnification fixed eyepieces. Uh, they can be towed in and out, you know, uh, yes, your inner pupillary distance, as we call it, to get it lined up with your eyes. And they're two 82 millimeter tubes, um, which are like our best performing Promenar lines and our spotting scopes. It is part of the Promenar series, which is our best performing products. Um, in Koa's line, it has the pure fluoride crystal lens elements uh, in the objective lens cell. Um, obviously, it's it's a bit of a niche product. You know, uh, it's mostly obviously designed for stationary use rather than it's not something you're going to lug around and and strap around your neck, right? But um, they do have a lot of uses, and people are doing a lot of glasses stationary. Um, I know we seen them used on the uh, like on the sea watch at the Cape May Bird Observatory um, various types of lodges with uh, eco lodges and things with with decks on the back um, are quite popular for astronomy actually because again with that fluoride crystal lens element in there they have superior control of, apple, um, of chromatic aberration so uh, a fully apochromatic view um, the best control of that with a, a pure chloride uh, Fluoride, fluoride crystal, easy for me to say, uh, lens objective um, as an element that controls chromatic aberration, which is also known as color fringing. Um, and essentially what that does by straightening out the prismatic separation of the various light wavelengths and bringing them back together at one point, 
um, not only are you getting truer colors, but also um, you're getting better definition because you're eliminating any ghosting that may occur by images slightly overlapped. You know, and as you get into higher magnification is when that becomes more noticeable. So that's why you see a lot more of that in the spotting scopes. Um, you know, uh, the need for that controlling the chromatic aberration and that's why our scopes perform so well uh, and rate at the top of all the independent reviews because um, that fluoride crystal, we're the only ones that use it um, in the photography world. Nikon and Canon both use it in their highest end. Um, long super telephoto lenses, similarly, uh, they'll use a, a pure telephoto, excuse me, pure fluoride crystal lens in there. Uh, what else can I talk about on the Highlanders? Would you like to add to that, Paul? No, I mean, they're just, they're a fantastic piece for observation, as you mentioned. Uh, we have a lot of people that use them for glassing. You know, you think about it, it's twin 82 millimeter uh, fluorite. Uh, lenses. So you're looking at what 164 millimeter um, of fluorite, uh, which is dwarfs anything we have in our line, even considering, you know, it's almost as much as 288s yeah. um, together. Uh, so it's drawn in a lot of light. And, you know, when people are looking farther distances and really need the detail, I mean, that's going to help out uh, uh, dramatically. There's not really anything else like it on the market as far as optical quality is concerned. Uh, they come stock with uh, fixed 32 power eyepieces. Um, there are uh, 21 power and 50 power eyepieces available, uh, sold separately. Uh, if you need a little more, if you need a little more mag, or if you need a little more field of view, but uh, probably 95% of the people run the 32s, and they're completely uh, happy with them. All right. And then uh, these are. Oh, I was gonna. Go ahead as well that uh, the Highlander binoculars are on sale as we speak. Uh, typically these retail for $5,000. Uh, right now for a limited time, they're at $39.99. So um, it's a great time to buy them if it's something uh, you need out for, you know, out on your deck. Um, if uh, you're doing some glassing, uh, scouting seasons upon us. So, you know, definitely uh, consider these as far as, uh, you know, an optimal stationary solution. Yeah, and another spot where we see a lot of those actually as well that I forgot to mention, you know, back in the, the day, back in the early 60s when Koa invented their first ever, created their first spotting scope, it was for the Olympic shooting team, the Japanese Olympic um, target shooting team uh, with long range shooters. And we see a lot of that yet today. The Highlander is a very popular model um, in that marketplace as well for the competitive shooting marketplace, which is growing. Um, and we, we still get a lot of that. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a, another application where people utilize our spotting scopes and the Highlanders a lot um, is when they want to be able to look down range and look at their targets uh, to see that well. So yeah, I was just looking too. I mean, we covered, we covered the optics, we went through it and uh, I just wanted to see, cause we did get in a couple of questions about that and um, you know, one of those was, was uh, with so many different binoculars out there, um, how do you really start to choose, you know, where to, where to begin? I mean, personally, I would say price point. I would, I would start there, like what you're comfortable spending, and then probably your app, you know, what application you're using. Um, it's tough, especially this time uh, as well, uh, with, without there being events or, you know, having a lot of opportunity to do in-store things because uh, ergonomics plays a huge role um, in this because there's so many different binoculars and so many at the same similar price points uh, that a lot of it comes down to just how they feel in your hands. And uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that opportunity of, uh, you know, being able to hand test, you know, several at a time has escaped us for now. Yeah, yeah. And the only way around that, and, and it's, it's, you know, a technique that some of our uh, successful dealers have used very effectively in the past is to say, well, if you can't decide, we'll send them both to you, send whichever one you don't want back. You know, of course, that usually requires obviously investing more up front, um, you know, but um, it is a one technique if you get it down to a couple different um, things. The other thing is, obviously, from a manufacturer rep standpoint, you know, yeah, you know, we're going to have a bias. Um, but when you say, what's your most popular models? 
for us, this is our best selling binocular here, our BD2 XD line. And that's primarily because, um, you know, people that have picked those up like those as well as anything, you know, um, that we have to offer even, even at that price point. I will add to that, that everyone I know who sold optics, um, who's effectively sold them, you know, and not as a used car salesman type where you're, um, you know, not giving people the truth, but I mean, give people what they deserve or what they want. Uh, you have to meet your expectations. Um, but the one thing that everybody says is pretty much, you know, almost universally, um, you pay more for a better product, you know, and the one thing that most people always tout is, you know, um, generally speaking, um, be prepared, you know, pay what you deserve. You know, you're going to use these things for a while. Um, the other thing too, as I kind of hinted at, or got to a little bit on the YF, so at hundred dollars, we have to make a lot of sacrifices, even in the process of manufacturing these. So they're not going to hold up as well as say a BD2 at over four times the price of 449 versus hundred dollars. So that's the other thing you need to consider too. If it's something you want to, um, you're also investing in the durability and the longevity of the product very often. Um, as you, you buy a better product, um, you know, and, and I think you can probably equate that to just about anything, you know, automobiles, um, everything, you know, the, the very highest priced products, um, generally are going to perform better for a longer period of time. Um, so you know, that's, that's another component to consider is, um, you know, buy the best you can afford is one of the sort of touted rules that people throw out there all the time. Or the old uh, buy once, cry once kind of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> with everything in life. If you have it for the next 10, 12, 15, 20 years even, um, you know, you, you start doing that math, it winds up being comparatively cheap, but still. Yeah, now I've got a, uh, let's see, that kind of covers that one. Uh, do you need super high magnification for astronomy? Uh, good question. And there is an advantage of both, you know, um, as you increase magnification, you know, obviously that's going to allow you to see, um, a larger subject, but it comes with its own perils because not only are you magnifying, um, everything that you're looking at, you are also magnifying all the movement in your system. And primarily that means this handshake is magnified by more. So um, very often people are surprised to learn, hand-holding at least, that they're able to dis discern more detail with lower power of magnification uh, because there will be a breaking point as to how much you can hold, how effectively you can hold something still uh, for each individual where at some point an increase in magnification <clears throat> may not be get you uh, the better ability to resolve detail. Um, in astronomy, very often though, excuse me, <clears throat> um, what people would do is they'll mount these to a tripod and these do have a little plug that comes out here and we do have our uh, uh, tripod adapter for binoculars um, that you can screw in here. It's got a single pedestal that will go right into a tripod and allow you to lock these onto a tripod solid. In that case, um, higher magnification um, can be more effectively used again, but you still You'll have to have a, a you know a, a solid tripod as well in the same way we do with our spotting scopes. Gotcha. A couple more rapid fire for you. Mm -hmm. Favorite size and series and why? Ooh. Well, I'm a sucker for field of view, as I already said. Um, you know, historically, I've always been one of these seven power guys. Um, in the Koa lineup. You know, I'm torn. I often use the eight and a half by 44, but I got to admit, I've got a super fun sweet spot for these six and a halfs over here because of the fact that um, for me, field of view and the eye pleasing view that I get um, through a lower power of magnification is very beneficial. The other thing is though too, I've always been a bit of a shaky person um, more so than others. And it's been harder for me to really hold a 10 power effectively um, since day one. So I've learned to, um, do more with a smaller field of, uh, I mean, a smaller subject, but with more light reaching my eye. So I'm seeing more detail on a slightly smaller subject. Um, and, and that's always been my way. I, I tend to be someone that 
goes down in power. Um, that said, I always have a spotting scope nearby too. I mean, I've gotten used to carrying a spotting scope everywhere I go as a professional uh, biologist and then tour guide respectively. So it's never, never without one. Gotcha. That was it through the question there. Um, right. Did want to mention as far as the binoculars go, you know, all binocular purchases are, uh, they include a strap uh, or a neck strap, a bag, cleaning cloth, and then your objective and ocular lens covers. Um, all the binoculars are covered under our limited lifetime warranty. So it covers you for the lifetime of the product for any manufacturer defects. Here in the U.S. Uh, yes. I need to point out. Uh, Pricing and warranty vary around the world, you know, depending on where you're at. And that's true of every binocular line, um, you know, so bear that in mind for those joining us from overseas. Um, very often in Europe, you'll see 10 year warranties as an example um, and, and a lot of the binoculars and then the ability to purchase, you know, a more warranty as a, as a premium um, an extended warranty, so to speak. But yeah, only in the U S do we see these lifetime warranties in Canada and North America, excuse me. Yeah. So if you're interested in more uh, information or talking to uh, a dealer regarding that, uh, go to our website, coa-usa.com, visit our dealer locator, and you'll be able to find someone local uh, that carries the line and get some more information uh, from them uh, regarding the promotions or the product itself. Uh, then also always feel free to ask us any questions. Uh, you can reach us at customer service at coa.com. Um, you're going to get a reply from me or Jeff. So anything uh, related to the optics, it's going to come from one of us. Um, if it's harder, um, it's going to come from Jeff. If it's uh, easy, it's probably going to come from me. So. Well, come on. Um, and then I guess another thing we can point out is we do have a full suite of, you know, how to um, videos over a hundred plus videos uh, that you can tune into on our YouTube channel. Um, which is it's uh, youtube.com backslash user backslash coa sporting optics. Um, or you can even, if you forget that, just, you know, search for coa sporting optics, you'll find us. Um, and there's over a hundred plus product videos that uh, give a lot of information plus uh, all of the past webinars we've given. So there's, there's a ton of information out there um, for those that might be looking. Fantastic. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have some more webinars coming up here shortly, uh, some various topics and stuff. So uh, tune in to those or once again, visit the YouTube channel for the uh, replays on those if you're not able to catch us live. Um, outside of that, um, I don't know. We call It's 11 a.m. It's called, called a day. I think we did it. Uh, <laughs> thanks all for tuning in and, and seeing us. And again, if you have any questions, we're happy to help them out uh, and we'll continue reaching out to you as, as Paul said, um, you know, we kind of like everyone had hoped by now that uh, this would be a thing of the past and, and yet we're still locked down and feeling the effects of, uh, of COVID-19. So until then, you know, we're going to continue to come at you as we can virtually um, offering unique topics. And I think uh, our next one's couple will be not, uh, optic driven, but, but more resource driven. So feel free and join us. Um, we'll be look on our website and, uh, uh, excuse me, on our Facebook pages, um, and look for the announcements, uh, on social media for the upcoming webinar schedule. And as always, they, if you miss them happily, we, we do have the evergreen copies, um, both on our Facebook page, uh, or on our YouTube channel. So you yeah. check those out. All right. All right, Mr. Bowden, good to see you, sir. I will talk to you soon. Everybody out there, please take good care um, and hope to see you soon in person. Take care. All right, thanks. See you guys.